Hello everyone, this is Professor Zaleski. Uh, I know the name listed says Dr. Campbell, but in fact you have me, Professor Zaleski, here with you to discuss the data analysis and management for your RHIT exam review. So we are going to be talking a lot to this next couple hours. There's a lot of material to cover um, and we will try to keep it succinct for you. So let's begin. Our content for today is we're going to talk about resources that you can reuse for your review for this particular domain. Um, then we're going to get into specifics, um, the data analysis and review tasks that are associated with the domain. And then I'll finish it up with some questions as well as some references. So here are some resources that we use for this particular domain. Of course, our sales textbook that uh, we probably use for almost every single review that we have in HIT 272L. It is the fourth edition of the Health Information Management Technology and Applied Approach textbook. Another uh, textbook that we use is the Horton book that you had for HIT 226, and this is the fourth edition, Calculating and Reporting Healthcare Statistics. Another resource used for this is the PRG, the Professional Review Guide for the RHIA and RHIT examinations by Schnering. Um, some of you may also have the third edition of the HIM Technology Applied Approach textbook by Johns. But, of course, you should definitely uh, use the sales textbook. Um, before I go any further, I jump ahead. Under here, under files, I have some files that I've shared with you. Um, the first one is the handout for this PowerPoint that we're using. So, um, please feel free to download it and save it for your review for future. Uh, I've also included a PDF of formulas for commonly computed healthcare rates. These are all of the rates that you learned in HIT 226 um, in one handy handout. So there they are for you in PDF format. And I've also included the AHIMA Data Analysis Toolkit, which is another resource that you should download and take some time to review. These next two slides list the tasks associated with the um, with this domain review. I'm not going to read every single one of them, but when you are studying, you should take time to go back and look at these tasks and make sure you understand them and feel comfortable with them. And that will give you a good idea that you are uh, proceeding along nicely with your studies. So here they are, here's one, and then here's some more tasks. This is one of the largest domains, uh, and there is a lot of material. So we will move forward. Our first slide here discusses filing numbering and retrieval systems. And of course, for most of this, this is going to be talking about paper-based health records. It could also be with hybrid records. Um, obviously, you have to have some sort of paper in order to file it. So what are some of the filing systems for our medical records? Our first is alphabetic, and that is obviously your filing by the patient's last name. This is very easy to create and easy to use. There's little training time. Uh, staff can get in and start using it immediately. However, there is no unique identifier, and if you do have two patients with the same name, there is definitely a chance uh, of risk of grabbing the wrong chart, and that could be deadly in healthcare. In addition, it bulks up specific sections of your uh, chart storage, particularly B, C, H, M, S, and W. You have a lot of patients with the last names that begin with those letters, so naturally you're going to have huge sections of, of those letters, and then your X and your Y are going to be maybe a quarter of a shelf each. So that causes a problem when you're trying to uh, locate and uh, be become efficient in your record storage. Um, it also can be time consuming to purge. So very easy to use, usually used in a smaller healthcare setting such as a doctor's office, but definitely not in a acute care facility. Our second is numeric. We're going to file the numbers straight. I'm sorry, well, let me rephrase it. We have three different ways of filing numerically. Again, when you are filing by numeric, you are filing by the medical record number. So when a patient is admitted, they're given a medical record number through the master patient index, and then that number is what's used to file. So we could go straight from 0001 to whatever the current number is, and that would be an example of straight filing. Uh, that is very easy to use. Uh, very easy to train. However, all of your recent admissions are lumped together. So 
right? And the average length of stay is about three days. If everybody's getting discharged at the same time, your last two cap, uh, shelves in your filing system are going to be jam-packed with everybody trying to get in and get the records. Not very efficient. And then we have Terminal Digit, which was uh, created by some mad genius in the uh, HIT world. And they came up with the idea that we're going to separate the letter, I'm sorry, the numbers into units. So in our example here, we have 754681. We have a primary, secondary, and tertiary unit, as you can see right there. And so what we do is when we file this number, we're actually going to reverse it and file it. Oh, there's a, a typo in there. So when I say filed as, it should be 814675, not 48, so you don't get confused. Um, and so what that's doing is it's evenly dispersing all of our records throughout our filing, cab our, our filing cabinet space. So all the admissions, when they're discharged, aren't going to be lumped in the same area. They're going to be evenly dispersed throughout your system. Um, it's a great way to you know, manage and be very efficient with your records. Um, you know, you're not going to have people lumped up. You're not going to be, uh, you're going to have less misfiles. Um, the, the negative to terminal digit filing, of course, would be training time. It does take some time for staff to get acclimated and understand how it's used. The third type of numerical filing is called middle digit. And this is just a different spin on terminal digit. And it's taking the same idea where we break it down into three components, a primary, secondary, and tertiary. However, we're filing it by the the middle two, the 46, then by the first two, 75, and then the last, 81. It's just another way. It's for smaller uh, smaller organizations to file their records. Um, very, very rarely used. Um, really, terminal digit is the, the main filing system that you will encounter. Our next type of filing system is alphanumeric. In this instance, we take the last couple letters of their last name, I'm sorry, the first couple letters of the patient's last name, and then follow it by the medical record number. So in my example here, we have John Smith, 754681. We're going to file that uh, record first alphabetically by SM, and then by the medical record number. This um, creates a unique identifier and an easy way um, to create the numbering system and use it. Again, there's not much training that has to be involved. It's very straightforward. You add that unique identifier that straight alphabetic uh, does not. However, you do run into the problem that you're going to bulk up your BC, HMS, and W filing areas because those are the most common last names. Then we have family numbering system. And in family numbering system, there's one medical record number assigned to a family. The, uh, the primary household person, whether it's a patriarch or a matriarch, will be given 01. And then every additional family member, usually by date of birth, is then given another number in front of that 010203. And this, you know, makes it really easy to locate pa patients, um, you know, uh, for a doctor's office, right? Your PCP, your pediatrician. However, when there's divorce or other situations, um, it's not that useful. So really, the only time you'll see a family, num a family numbering system is in a pediatric office. All right, next we're going to talk about identification systems. An identification system is uh, how we identify the patient, obviously. And you should all know that we identify our patients by medical record number, right? We don't use name. We don't use social security number. We use a medical record number that is assigned through the master patient index. We have three types of identification systems. And our first is the serial numbering system. And that means every time somebody comes in, to the hospital to be admitted, they're given a brand new medical record number, whether they've been there before or not. This helps out registration. So when somebody comes in, they don't need to find out where you here before, they just re-register them to begin with, okay? Um, then going forward, they say, okay, well, my name is Greg Zaleski and I have medical record number 1234567, uh, 342782, so on and so forth. So one patient would have multiple medical record numbers in that facility. You know, then that could be a problem. Certainly if the physician's not aware of previous allergies, previous surgeries, um, that could, it's not, you know, very good for patient care, okay? Um, then we have a unit numbering system, and this is the most common that you will see. In a unit numbering system, when a patient comes in, uh, the very first time that they come in, they're given a medical record number. 
and then every subsequent admission they're using that same medical record number. However, this does require the admissions department, the registration department, to make sure that they're looking and finding that, um, that previous admission. And that sometimes does not always happen, whether the patient changed their name or, you know, they just don't look properly. There was a data entry um, the first time they were admitted. Um, so there can be lookup problems finding that initial admission. But it is the best because what happens is that person has one medical record, you know, one medical record number, and therefore one medical record. So if I was there before, I come back, they go, they pull my old record, and it's brought forward, and any new information is added to that uh, old chart. Okay. And then they have serial number uh, unit, which is when a patient receives a new number every single time they're admitted, very much like serial. However, they will bring those old records forward and attach it to that new record so that all the previous information is available for the physician. And that is called serial unit. All right, moving on, we're going to talk about filing. Um, there's centralized versus decentralized. Centralized means all the records are on site. Most organizations have records stored on, uh, all, in, all, in one, all in one place in the basement. Um, decentralized means that they ran out of room and they have to store these records somewhere else. So they sent them to a storage facility or they have another office and they have some storage space in the basement there so they move some over there. That's all that it means. Decentralized means the records are stored at multiple locations. Um, color coding is a way to identify misfiles. So when we have our filing system and we're going to go uh, create that record, uh, the medical record numbers and then la the 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 um, last name. Every letter and every number has a unique color. So on the side of that chart, they're going to have Z A L, right, for my last name. And Z might be purple, and red, will, and A will be red, and L will be yellow. And my medical record number one, two, three, four, five, six. Each number has its own unique color. And they put those on the end of that chart. So when it gets filed in the shelf, whether we're filing, you know alphabetic or alphanumeric, you're going to see misfiles stand out, right? So if all Zs are, are what did I say? Well, I say red, and all of a sudden we see a yellow uh, sticker on there and between all those reds, we can obviously see that there's been a misfile. So color coding is just a great way uh, to ensure that charts are not misfiled. Um, then we talk about chart tracking system. So we have, all, again, this is for all paper-based records or hybrid records. Um, you know, individuals request records all the time, whether it's a physician, whether it's quality management, whether it's the executive director or the medical director, people request charts all the time. And we have to ensure uh, in the HIM department that we're tracking these records. So the process works a little something like this. The individual who wants the record comes down to the department. They will fill out a requisition slip. And when they have that requisition slip, it'll have the name of the patient that they want, uh, maybe their date of birth, and then the requester's name. HIM staff takes that requisition slip, they slide it into something called an out guide. And an out guide is usually uh, a piece of pla a, a, a heavy plastic, and it's longer, it's like a legal size, so it's 8.5 by 14, and there's a little pocket. So they take that requisition slip, they slide it into the pocket of that file, that heavy duty plastic file. And when they pull the chart, that file goes where that chart was, okay? And so it sticks out a little longer because it's eight and a half by 14. So, and it's usually bright red. So we know that that chart is, is out. And then if we, you know, pull out that out guide, we can see who it was given to. So we have a way to always know where all the records are at all times. So then we give that chart to that person. They go on their merry way. And they, at the end of the day, we go to make sure that all charts have been returned, and it's real easy because you know what charts have, are out because there's a big red out guide sticking where that chart was. Um, it's also very common to include a, a tracking system, usually something as simple as Excel or maybe a little software system that you can also use to, to type in who requested the chart when they requested it um, and have an electronic system to keep track of this information as well. Of course, depending on the size of the organization, you might need something like that. Uh, versus a doctor's office, you would not have to do that. But sure, if we have you know uh, 18,000 discharges a year, 
we might want a nice central way to look at charts, uh, you know, information system to track charts. Um, next, I want to talk about file audits and reconciliation. And what is a file audit? A file audit is when we're making sure we have the records that we say we have. So uh, a reconciliation is the same. It's the same. It's if it's file audits and reconciliation it goes hand in hand. So at the end of the year, I'm going to run a report from my master patient index and tell me all the patients that were discharged that previous year. And it's going to spit it out, hopefully alphabetical or by year or by uh, medical record number. And then I'm going to give that to my staff and they're going to check off that every single chart on that report matches up to a physical chart in the department. Okay, it's called reconciliation. It's making sure that we have what we what we think we have. And obviously, if we come up with charts that are missing, we need to go check that chart tracking system. We need to look for out guides uh, and start uh, doing some investigation as to where those charts might be. Loose filing is the term when uh, after a patient has been discharged, we usually go up to the floor and pick up that chart, and inevitably there'll be some loose pieces of paper that come down to our department, whether it's lab results, whether it's um, you know physician orders, uh, discharge instructions. There's always these documents that come down after we've picked up the chart, and that's called loose filing. And what we have to do is we have to take that loose filing and incorporate it into the chart if it's already been assembled. And then um, in this uh, section, we want to talk about record retention and destruction. And the uh, you really want to go by the federal standards, um, but of course you need to check your state standards. Uh, AHIMA does have some information regarding record retention and destruction, um, but it's really important for you to know what is your state standard. Um, typically, it's seven years after the uh, date of discharge. So that's usually when... Um, I'm sorry, after the date of di yeah, discharge, usually when those records can be destroyed. But again, it may depend on your state. So it all the record detention schedule is all derived by the last date of service. So if I was discharged in 2015, if the seven years is the standard in 2022, that's when those records can be destroyed. Well, really 2023, January 1st, 2023. So it's seven years after that last date of service. The wrinkle in this is when you're dealing with minors. Anybody under the age of 18, you have to uh, account for um, the fact that the that countdown of seven years doesn't begin until they turn 18. So if you have a patient who's 12, you have to keep it till they're 18. That would be six years. And then an additional seven years after the age of 18. So you'd have to keep that particular record for 13 years. So when you're dealing with minors, it's really important to understand that their record retention is not by um, just the last date of service, it's also by the date of birth. So it's really important to understand that. How do we store records? Well, in some facilities, you're, you, mostly it's in paper until they're ready to be destroyed. Um, to be destroyed. Um, but uh, there are still places that have microfilm, right? And that's when we take a photographic image on a little tiny microfilm, uh, and then we destroy the paper and we have this little rolls of microfilm. Um, that way we put them in a reader. For those of you who are a little bit older, you may remember them in the local library. Um, and there are three different uh, types of microfilm. The first would be roll microfilm, which is exactly what it sounds. It's a roll of film. looks like a, a little tiny film, like a, a movie. Video, uh, uh, a movie. Um, and you put it in a machine and it rolls it up. Then you have your jacket microfilm, which is taking the pieces of microfilm but lining it up in a pocket uh, in pockets on a sheet of uh, on, a, on a on a sheet of uh, a plastic sheet the benefit to a jacket microfilm versus a roll microfilm is once you put something on a roll microfilm you can't add to it so if i find a record uh, i'm sorry a piece of paper a discharge summary on a patient that's already been put on roll microfilm i now have to take that and put it on a different roll and now that patient's records exist on two different reels. And that can be really confusing um, and really separate and fragment the chart um, and you know in storage purposes. And finally there's microfiche, which is very similar to jacket microfilm, only it can store more images. Um, our last uh, type of uh, storage is more talking about electronic images. 
And for a while there in the early 2000s, we did scan images to CDs. We burned them to CDs. However, that has some limitations. Only one person can look at the CD at a time. You have to have a backup of the CD. Um, you can't, again, you can't, like much like roll microfilm, once you've burned it into a CD, you can't add or you can't delete. It gets very hard to manage the data. So now we have something called electronic document management systems. And that's where we take those images and store them on a server, on a database. And now we can add, we can delete. It's a much easier way uh, to manage those images. And then if we want to um, destroy them when the retention period has come up, it's a click of a button. There's no worries about having to destroy the paper and, and so on and so forth. So an electronic e EDMS, electronic document management system, is currently what is used in many organizations for their electronic files. Um, let's talk a little bit about the content of the health record. We have first our administrative content, which are things that are not needed to treat the patient, right? So if we didn't have any administrative information in the medical record, we could still help that patient out and provide them the care they need, uh, which is why it's called administrative. Things like consent to treat, consent to use PHI, um, advanced directives, valuables lists, and those sorts of things, um, as you can see here on the slide, um, all legal stuff, right? But our content of the health record when it comes to clinical includes obviously those things that are needed to treat the patient. Their documentation of what has occurred to the patient um, under our course, under our care. Things such as the medical history and physical exam, the diagnostic and therapeutic orders, our clinical observations, which include things like progress notes, consult reports, any sort of ancillary services like physical therapy, um, you know, uh, surgical services. So we have lots of different things under the category of clinical observations. And then we also have, of course, our conclusions, which is our discharge summary and our discharge plan. So it's really important. You need to know the basics. And the basics are, what does a health record consist of? Uh, and if you look in your sales textbook, it breaks it down for you, all the different forms that you might see, um, not only in an acute care record, but in a specialized health record as well, because you're going to find specific documentation, for example, in behavioral health or in um, uh, home health care or in outpatient. OK, so understanding the documents found in each type of care setting is really important. Next, we have the, f the actual format of the health record. And that means how are the files, how are the pieces of paper inside that file folder filed? How are we keeping it arranged? And there are three different types that you will find. Um, the first is source-oriented, and this is the most common type. Source-oriented means that the records are filed according to um, their origin. In other words, all nurses' notes are together. All lab orders are together. All physician orders are together, right? The source, who's creating that document? is all going to be filed together. okay? And that's really great, especially when you're auditing a chart, because you can see what's been done and what hasn't. Um, however, it's not exactly great for the caregivers, the healthcare providers. So now we have uh, go on to something called problem-oriented. And problem-oriented has, it's definitely different than your source-oriented record. What it's going to do is it's going to list our problems on what they call a problem list, right? It's going to list you know, broken leg, um, punctured lung, and um, migraine, concussion. And that's our problem list. And we're going to give each diagnosis a number, one, two, and three. And then we have a care plan, which acknowledges how we're going to tackle all of those three issues. But when, any, but when a provider writes a note to a particular problem, they're only going to reference that particular issue. Like, for example, the concussion would be number three. So if I'm the neurologist, I'm going to make sure I write down number three, concussion, and I'm going to write a SOAP note that is tailored to that particular problem. So, for you know, and why do we do this? Well, does a neurologist care about a broken leg or the punctured lung? I mean, they might want to look at it, but they don't want to flip through 60 pages of notes about the respiratory care when they're really concerned about the concussion. So problem oriented is the records are, are sorted by a problem. <laughs> that right makes sense. And finally, we have integrated. And integrated is the most unusual, very rare that you'll see integrated. And what integrated means is it's like a book 
from, it reads from the date of admission to the date of discharge. And so date of admission might be the admission physician order. And then right behind that, you'll have the history and physical. And then right behind that, you'll have uh, nurse's notes. So the entire record is, is, is documented as things occurred, which, you know, it makes sense if you want to read exactly what happened from beginning to end for that particular patient. But if I'm a nurse's note, if I'm writing a, a nurse's note, and then I have to go get another piece of paper, and then I have to include it in the chart, and it can get very cumbersome for those providers um, to find things that they're looking for. For example, the physician wants to know what's the most recent lab value for the patient. Well, now I got to flip through 30 pages and find the most recent lab value. So it's not a very common type of format that you'll see. Um, and this term outguide here is an error. That should not be there. We talked about outguides already. All right, so let's talk about analysis of the health record. We're going to analyze the record. Um, there's two types of analysis that we do in the HIM department. The first is quantitative and the second is qualitative. And it's important to understand the difference between the two because they do sound quite a bit alike. Quantitative, think about quantity. Okay, you're thinking about a number of things that occurred. And it's a review of the health record to determine its completeness and accuracy. All right, so for example, are all the physician orders signed? Was the history and physical done within 24 hours? Are all the telephone verbal orders uh, read back by the nurse? And so on and so forth. It's something that, yes, we have to have a knowledge of the chart of the requirements of the standards, um, but that's really, it's, it's limited to counting and seeing if something is there or not. It's very different than qualitative. And we think of qualitative, you're gonna think of quality. And it's the identification of inconsistent or inaccurate documentation. And the one example I'd like to use is, let's say you have a young child who is six years old, and you look in the medication list and you see that that child was given aspirin, and you see that it was correctly signed, the right dosage, everything is there, it all makes sense. However, if we were to use our uh, knowledge of the disease, and we know that children shouldn't be given aspirin or they could develop Ray's syndrome, right? So that's, you know, we need, we need knowledge of, of, uh, of um, disease processes in order to notice that, right? So if anybody's looking at it in general, they say, okay, well, all the content is there, but yet the quality isn't there because a physician should never give a patient um, aspirin, a child aspirin in that situation, okay? So those are very uh, good examples of the uh, analysis. All right, so now that we've talked about quantitative and qualitative, let's move on. Let's talk about patient identity management. And in patient identity management, we're talking about um, how do we identify a patient. Uh, and we do that through Master Patient Index, or what they call now RADT. Master Patient Index, or RADT, which stands for Registration, Admission, Discharge, and Transfer, is a way that we record the name and, and medical record number of every patient who's been admitted into the facility. Okay, and then um, it's, it's really the, the original and uh, most important index in any organization, because it's where you find whether a patient had been here before, what dates of service they had, what, uh, when they were discharged, um, it's like the ba most basic information system uh, that an organization uses. However, we do have some issues that arise with Master Patient Index, and um, they are right listed below. There's three of them, duplicate, overlay, and overlap. A duplicate issue is that if one patient has multiple medical record numbers. Okay, so that would be in a unit numbering system that we talked about earlier. So um, I have a, a medical record, and yet when I, let's say, let's take a female who got married and they got a new last name. When, when they came into the emergency room department, and then they're going to be admitted, and they're going, to reg going through the registration process, they don't find that patient's uh, by their new ma uh, married name. They didn't find it under their maiden name. And, let, and the patient has an allergy to sulfa. Well, they wouldn't know that on that new admission, and therefore could lead to some severe consequences to that patient. So... That is definitely an issue now that we have two medical record numbers for one patient. We want to certainly not have that in this particular situation of unit numbering. A second issue could be overlay. That's when multiple patients have the same medical record number. 
So both myself and Bob Smith have the same medical record number, and that can lead to same type of quality issues. He might be a different blood type than me, but if they are looking under the medical record number, we could easily be given the wrong blood for a blood uh, blood type for a blood transfusion. Again, it's a major quality concern. And then finally, overlap. Overlap's a newer phenomenon that we're seeing in um, healthcare, and that's because um, these enterprise health systems have, uh, you know, they've bought out other systems, they have their own doctor's offices, their own private practices, and what happens is even though you're under one enterprise system, you have different medical record numbers. So my PCP might me have me as this medical record number, but the acute inpatient has me at this medical record number, and so they're not able to uh, match them, okay, and that's called an overlap, all right, and that occurs again within one giant healthcare system, and we're seeing obviously those more and more. The next couple, couple of slides, what I've done for you here is I've taken, we talk about data a lot, and you hear it there and you hear it in this place and hear it in another place. So what I've done is I've, I've taken all the different types of data that you will encounter, and I'm discussing them in the next several slides. So that if you're ever unsure, well, what's this data, what's that, you can go right to these slides and do a quick review. So our first type here, uh, uh, two types, are administrative versus clinical, and I mentioned that earlier. Right? The administrative is demographic and financial information, whereas clinical data is regarding the patient's medical condition, diagnosis, and procedures performed and treatment provided. Okay, the progress notes, the history and physical, and so on and so forth. Um, another uh, two different types of data is structured versus unstructured. Structured data is data that is entered. Uh, into a control format. So usually think about, you know, check boxes, drop down boxes, radio buttons. Your entry options are only are limited to what they tell you you can enter. And so think about uh, if you're entering um, sex into a uh, history and physical, right? You'd hit, click a drop down box. Your options are either male or M for male, F for female, or U for unknown. You can't type in anything else. So that, again, that would be structured data versus unstructured data, which is free-flowing text. And this is good for um, uh, history of present illness, discharge summary. Those are things where somebody wants to tell you a story, give you some information in several paragraphs. It's not going to be limited to characters. So uh, when you think about history and physical, the, patient's, or the, the physician's going to document, the patient presented with a fever and abdominal pain sent the patient to the MRI to have it, da, 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 and then all the way through, they had the, the appendectomy, patient's doing fine, and they kind of get, and now the patient's being discharged home, right? That is unstructured data. It's a paragraph, okay? It's very important to have a story of what's happening with the patient, but it's really important to stress here that structured data gives us information for reporting and manipulation. We can do, we can, we can, we can play with data when it's structured, male, female, temperature, uh, diagnoses, ICD-10 diagnoses, uh, so on and so forth, we can manipulate that data. Unstructured data is very important on an individual basis, but we can't do much with it uh, as an organization. We also have categorical, categorical data, otherwise known as scales of measurement, and we have four different types. And our first type is called nominal data, categories with no recognition or order, no recognition of order. So for an example, would be insurance, right? You have 100 patients, 33 of them have Medicaid, 12 have Medicare, 14 have Blue Cross Blue Shield. There's no, no one is better than the other. They're just different categories, okay? And that is the lowest level of measurement. Our next one is ordinal data. And ordinal data has um, some semblance of an order, but it's not very measurable. And to give you an example of ordinal data would be pain scale, right? You know the pain scale you see in history and physical with the unhappy face at a one, you know, crying, and then all the a happy smiley face is the number 10, right? So there's a correlation that six is worse than seven or 10 is better than nine, but it's all subjective and it doesn't really give us that much information other than it's giving us a relationship to the other numbers. Okay, so it has an order, but that's about it. That's an example of ordinal data. And now we're, we're going up the, uh, up the chain here. So nominal is the lowest type of data, and now we're, we're slowly moving up to the best type of data. So our next one is interval data. 
and interval data has um, that there's there's intervals that are exactly the same from one measurement to another. So you can measure the difference between one and another, but there is no true zero. And you could say, well, what the heck does that mean? What do you mean there's no true zero? Think about temperature, right? It can be zero degrees outside, but does that mean there is no temperature? No, it just means that's just a way of measuring the temperature, right? There's never an absence of temperature. So that's um, what we would use as interval data. But the difference between 98 and 99 degrees is the exact same difference between 5 degrees and 6 degrees. Okay, so our intervals are equal, but there is no zero. Versus our highest level of measurement, which is ratio. And the best example for ratio data is age. Okay, the difference between 39 and 40 is the same as 10 and 11. However, there is a true zero. You can be zero age, you could be unborn, right? So ratio has an absolute zero where interval does not. And again, the ratio is the best type of, uh, of data to use uh, for statistical purposes. We also have two different types of numerical data. Our first is discrete data which is finite values with specific values. What does that mean? Well, I can tell you that, you know, you might hear the saying, well, the average family in America has 3.2 children. Well, there's no such thing as 3.2 children. You either have three children or you have four children, okay? So a discrete data would be the number of children you actually have. I have three children, right? Um, it could also be the number of cavities you have. How many cavities you have? I have one. You don't have one and a half cavities and you certainly don't have two and a half children. Okay, that, those are all solid. There's no um, decimal points. There's no fractions in discrete data. But continuous data, um, and I like this, this, this definition here, it's a variable that is limited to only to the degree of accuracy and can take on a fractional value. Okay, it's only limited to the amount of measurement that we can do. So two examples of continuous data are age and height. I can tell you that I'm 28 years, I wish, 28 years old, three months, four days, two hours, three seconds, and I could keep going only to the degree of which we can measure it as human beings. There is no, I'm only 39 years old. No, I can be 39 point blah, 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 blah. The same thing with height. I could tell you I'm 6'4", again, I wish, and then I could say I'm 6'4", and break it down to millimeters, and blah, 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 blah. So it, it, it's always a fractional. Okay, that's the difference between continuous. And you think about continuous, it continues on and on and on. It's only limited by how we can uh, measure it. All right, moving on, let's talk about uh, more types of data. <laughs> um, and this has to deal with group uh, grouping of data, the identification of data. And our first one here is patient specific slash identified. And that's saying the patient is identified within the data. So patient specific data would be the medical record, your medical record number. You were obviously identified in the medical record number. So a medical record is a perfect example of patient specific. Patient identifiable is when we can reduce, remove some information about a patient, but yet I could still figure out who you are. For example, if you remove my name from my medical record number, but yet you still include my zip code, my age, I could run some reports if I had some access to some county records and almost figure out who I am, okay? So as they, as they define here, the identity of the patient can be derived or inferred from the computer. So we could do some data crunching and figure out who I am, even without my name. Aggregate data is information about a specific group of patients, but it cannot be used to identify a patient. And we use aggregate data most of the time in healthcare, right? You're gonna tell me the length of stay for congestive heart failure uh, for all the men in the hospital, and it's 4.2, okay? You can tell me information about a group of people, right? That's what we're really derive, driving at when we, take, when we talk about statistics and aggregate data. That's what we want. We want to know information about a specific group of people. And, of course, the information in that, we can't find one particular person in that group, right? It's just about the group. And our fourth, time here, our fourth uh, type of data here is de-identified data, and that means all the PHI has been redacted, and redacted just as a fancy way of saying removed, right? So there's no way, with whatever computer algorithm, whatever, that they can figure out who I am 
in that medical record if they removed my, all of my PHI, and that would be de-identified data. Next, we're going to talk about data elements, okay? And we're going to talk about turning data into, into data into information. But it's important to understand that data is unprocessed facts and figures, right? When we enter data into a computer, it could be temperature, 98.6. 98.6 all by itself, it tells us a little bit of information, but not really. It's unprocessed facts and figures. But if we were to take my temperature over a four-day course, uh, four-day period, we could see it rise or fall, uh, and when all of a sudden we're getting information. Um, information is data that's been processed, okay? And we take this information and we turn it into facts, and facts is information we believe to be true. And when we get enough facts together, now we move on to uh, knowledge and what we know. Okay, and this is important because we take little bits of data and it creates knowledge for us. And that allows us to make better decisions. Allows us allows the CEOs, the CIOs to make better decision making. And it all starts with a little bit of data collection. Okay, there's a uh, acronym in the information technology world called GIGO, G-I-G-O. Garbage in and garbage out. If we don't put in good data, we get garbage information. We then base our facts on bad information, and then therefore we don't have correct knowledge and make bad decisions. So it's really important at the very beginning to get good information. Data dictionary um, allows for the ability to create information, right? So in order to get good information, we need to have something called the data dictionary. We need to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. If we have inconsistent or inaccurate data, we will get bad information. Think about using the term male, M-A-L-E, versus just the letter M. Can you compare male, M-A-L-E, versus the letter M if you were to combine data? No, you can't. All right, the computer wouldn't understand it. Think about the Y2K problem, right? We didn't have those first two digits in the year. We just had 96, right? And everybody was concerned that, oh, wow, when we go to compare data, what's the computer the computer is going to think the year 8215 is the same as you know 8215 could be 82215 or 821916 so if we do not give our data meaning the information derived is meaningless and we do this through a data dictionary and we have five pieces there's five core pieces to a uh, good data dictionary the first we're gonna talk about temperature we're gonna we're gonna enter temperature into our data dictionary and how are we gonna do that so our first is our we're gonna name the field and the name of our field is gonna be temperature not temp dot or just T no the field name is temperature what are the type of what's kind of the well, I'm sorry what is the type of data field in other words what kind of entries can we make into this field and we can limit it to just numeric, meaning just numbers. So if somebody wants to write DES in the temperature field in our electronic health record, they're not going to be allowed to. They're only going to be allowed to enter numbers. Our next um, uh, part of data dictionary is the field size. How big do we want the field to be? And for our temperature, we want to be a maximum number of four characters, right? Do we want to take temperature out to the, the second decimal place, the, the um, hundredths? No, we don't. We don't want 101.52. A, we don't measure it that way, and B, it's unnecessary. So we only want it to be able to be four characters long. And then we have to have a definition. What is it that we're collecting? And here our definition is something very simple. Body temperature as, measure, as measured in Fahrenheit. And you can see why that's important. We're not doing Celsius at our hospital. No, no, no. We're collecting temperature as in Fahrenheit, okay? And our last two are values and edits. So we've already said it's numeric, meaning only numbers are able to be entered, but now we're even going to limit it further with our values. And our values would be 0 through 9, okay? In this case, we're not really, we're not really limiting it because every single number could be a possible entry into our temperature field. And then we have what we call edits. And our edits could be um, either hyphens or 
um, decimal places. Think about when you're online and you're purchasing something and you, uh, well, let's now, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, give a different example. Let's say you're entering your social security number. The computer knows that after you type the first three numbers, it puts a hyphen, then two numbers, then a hyphen, and then four numbers. That makes it so that the person who's doing the data entry doesn't have to enter the hyphens, or if you're doing, in this particular case, the temperature, 101.9, you have the point there that you don't have to enter. So it uh, creates better, uh, all about creating better data. This is very important. Everybody should know this, data quality characteristics. Uh, you should understand that um, what makes up good data. And I've listed them here. I'll run through them real quick. You guys should all know this. Hint, hint. Okay. Data accuracy is that the data is correct, right? Gregory Zaleski is the correct name in the chart. That's the easy one. But is it accessible, right? Can the physician log in and look up my name? Is the data comprehensive? Uh, is all the data that is required being captured? So if you're doing a history and physical and the Joint Commission requires that you capture the last immunization, well, you better have that in your medical record, in your fields of your history, you know, for your history and physical. So it has to be comprehensive. It has to be consistent. The data has to be reliable. If I run a report this morning and then I run it again tomorrow morning, it has to be the same information, right? I'm not getting uh, different results, okay? Uh, and then currency, is the information up to date? Am I, when I'm looking at lab values, am I getting the most recent lab values or am I getting last week's lab values? Of course, I want the most up-to-date information. Uh, all the data is defined using, our, of course, our data dictionary. Um, granularity is the data is defined at the correct level of detail. And this would be very important in lab values, right? So how many uh, microliter per grams are you going to take out this lab test and so on and so forth? Uh, the temperature, how many decimal places do you want to take out temperature to, right? Um, so we want to make sure the data is defined to the right uh, level of detail. Um, precision, that would be the expected data values. So I can't enter numbers in the temperature, I'm sorry, I can't enter letters in the temperature. I could only enter numerical values in for the temperature. Relevancy. Is the data that we're collecting useful? Right? And this is really important. Um, a lot of times, maybe, are we collecting data that is unimportant to anybody and unuseful and unhelpful? Could be. So we really only want to co collect what uh, is, is necessary in, uh, in order to create a comprehensive health record. And uh, finally, are we documenting the uh, event at the time? I'm sorry, are we documenting at or near the time of the event? So if uh, the doctor is writing an order, is it the order from last night or is it a current order? And we always, of course, want to document as soon as the event occurs. All right, now we're going to move on to, I told you, guys, this was a long domain. Now we're going to move on to databases. A database is an organized collection of data in a standardized format. Okay, so basically it's a place to store data. Right? We're collecting all this data. Where is it going? It's residing on a server in a, data, a database inside a server. And there are three different types of databases. The first is relational. And when we think of a relational database, think about Excel. It stores information in columns and rows. Right? That's what it's doing. Um, it's storing characters. It's, um, and, of course, we, we create a lot of characters in our um, healthcare environment. But we also have something called object-oriented. And in an object oriented, we actually store objects that are not particularly um, traditional styles of data. For example, how about sonograms or uh, pictures or audio or video, right? Anything that is, uh, you know, just again, think of pictures or sound, wave files, GIFs, um, JPEGs, any of those sorts of newer technology, they have to be, they can't be stored in a relational database. That's just text. They have to be stored in something called an object-oriented database, okay? And then we have object relational, which means it can store both uh, object-oriented and relational uh, types of data. We also have things called the primary keys and the foreign keys, and I have an example here to show you. So here we have two different tables inside of our database. We have the patient table and we have a vital signs table. 
the most important thing to remember about a database is that it allows us to reduce redundancy. Once I record a patient's name, I no longer have to record it again. I just merely have to link the other data to that name via the patient table. So to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, here we have three patients. We have their medical record numbers, we have their names, and their date of birth. In yet another table, we have vital signs being stored. In a traditional format, I'd have to re-record their medical record number, the last name, the first name, all that information yet again in vital signs in order to compare it and to, and to uh, manipulate it, but not so with a relational database because I'm using something called primary keys and foreign keys. I tell my patient table that the medical record number is a primary key and that any time I use medical record number in another database, it will link to this table. Okay, so if I use the medical record number 456789, that links to this table and gives me any information I need to know about John Lennon. So we go down to vital signs, and here we are, we're recording heart rate, blood pressure, and temperature. Well, if I have a column in here and I label it medical record number, I tell my database that this is a foreign key, it knows to link this foreign key, being the medical record number, all the way up to the primary key found in the patient table. So I don't have to rewrite last name, first name, and date of birth. When I have a database management system and I run information on this medical record number, it can pull information from the patient table as well as the vital sign table. Okay, so a foreign key is a link to a different table. There are different types of um, database management systems. Um, there, it, basically, it's computer software that, ables, that is, enables users to create, modify, delete, or view data in a database, and it can also be from multiple databases, okay? So if we have software, it can access multiple databases, merge it into one, and give us reports, okay? And it allow, so it basically, it allows computer applications to access the data, right? And so we have three different types of, I mean, listen, there's, there's a lot more than this, but these are the most common ones you'll see, SQL, Oracle, and Sybase. Okay, so if you hear SQL, you should understand that that is a software that allows us to manipulate data. Really quick, we're going to talk about data sets. And what is a data set? A data set is a list of recommended data elements with uniform definitions that are relevant for a particular use. Okay, so to give you an example, Hopefully you guys remember this. The UHDDS is a collection of all is collected on all inpatient admissions as required by CMS, the Universal Hospital Data and Discharge Set. You guys remember UHDDS, right? It's required by CMS. And it has I think 28 elements in it. I don't remember the specific number, but anybody who collects who who offers inpatient services has to collect these elements. Okay, and what's important for you guys to understand is to know when you is to recognize a data set, understand what setting it is in, some of the unique elements for that data set, and what is the function of that data set. And of course, is it required? And if it's required, what federal law is requiring it? So here are some examples of data sets. There's the UHDDS I mentioned. Um, UACDS, ambulatory, here's emergency room, and so on and so forth. So when you um, save this uh, PowerPoint, you should look up these different data sets and understand what they are, what they're used for, and any particular elements that they capture. All right, let's talk about data sources real quick. We have a primary data and secondary data. Everyone should know that a primary data source is the medical record, right? Our health records. That's where the information is being recorded at the or near the time of event. Okay. However, many times we take data from the primary data source and we enter it into another place, such as indices and registries. Okay. So again, a secondary data source, such as indices and registries, take data from our primary data source, which is our medical record. All right, so our secondary data sources, we have an index and registries, and we're going to, and healthcare data bases and stuff. So we're going to talk about first about an index. 
And I'll read the definition here. It's an unorganized list of specific data that serves to guide, indicate, or otherwise facilitate reference to the data. All right, so in other words, when we're looking for something, if we want to find something, we use an index, right? And the most common one that we use as, as professionals is the Master Patient Index, the MPI, or RADT. We want to find out if a patient was here before, we go to the Master Patient Index. We get their medical record number, and then we go find that chart. Okay. If we want to find out all patients who had congestive heart failure, we would go to that disease index, enter that uh, ICD-10 diagnosis, and it would tell us every single patient that had congestive heart failure. It's a way to find information. Okay. That is what is 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 uh, the purpose of an index. And we also have operation indexes as well as a physician index. Now, a registry contains more extensive data than just an index, right? An index is just pointing us to where the record is so we can get more information. But a registry is actually a collection of care, of treatment information that is related to a specific disease condition or procedure. And it usually follows that patient for the rest of their lives, right? So if we create a registry and we enter somebody into that registry, more often than not, it's going to follow them um, through the course of their treatment or their life, depending on the type of registry. So we have two terms here that you should know, case definition and case finding. So if I have a cancer registry, I'm going to have to define my cancer registry. Maybe it's stage two neoplasms. Maybe it's only malignant tumors. Maybe it's only, um, you know, carcinoma. Whatever type of, whatever we're trying to collect should be identified within that case definition. And then we have case finding. How are, like, so in registries, we're taking information from the primary record and we're entering it somewhere else. Well, if that's your job, if you're a cancer registrar, how do you find new cases of cancer? That's what case finding means. How do you find your data to enter into your registry? Well, case finding, and a great example for that would be a disease index. You would go to the disease index and search for cancer codes, and that would lead you to the records and they would go to those individual records and pull out the information and enter it into your registry. Okay, so again, it's more extensive information. It's about treatment from multiple sources and it's following the patient uh, over a long period of time. And here are some examples of a registry. Our third type of secondary uh, data is a healthcare database. And these are uh, federal or state mandated databases that require that we collect certain information and submit it okay so the state the federal government saying you have to collect this data and you have to submit it to us some examples would be medpar medpar is um, billing data on medicare recipients for inpatient care so we have to um, export data directly into the federal government's database on any medicare uh, patient that we've serviced okay uh, there's also these other two. The other one I'll mention is the National Practitioner Database. So it's a national database that tracks uh, malpractice suits uh, against physicians. So a physician who maybe has his license revoked in New Jersey can't just drive across country and get a job in California and without that organization being aware of those physicians' actions. Okay, so again, that's the National Practitioner Database. Um, it is required, uh, and it's a great tool. So when we do registries or um, healthcare databases, what we have to do is something called abstracting. And abstracting is just the process of taking elements of data and putting it somewhere else, right? If we're doing a, a cancer registry, we're finding out the patient's name, uh, the type of cancer, when it was diagnosed, what treatments they received, what medications they received, and we're entering it into this registry. There are two different ways we can do this. One is manual. You actually look up the chart, you find the information, you type it into the registry. Um, or you can do it electronically, right? Some systems, especially when you're talking about um, healthcare databases, um, they're files that we send over and you don't have to actually manually enter the information into the healthcare database. It's done in an automatic process. And that would be an example of electronic abstracting. Um, I just want to, again, when we talk about analyzing data, stress the fact that we want to turn data into knowledge. 
Okay. And again, I'm mentioning here the AHIMA Data Analysis Toolkit, which is available for download here under um, files on your right hand side. So when you have a moment, please uh, do so. Now we're going to talk about data display. Our first data display that I'd like to mention is tables. Tables are great because they display a large amount of data. Um, you don't have to create a graph. It is what it is straight from Excel. Um, it shows exact values and you can't really distort the data like you sometimes can with a graph or a chart. It just lists the data. I'm going to talk about uh, real quick some parts of a table. The first we have is the title and in this situation the title is the operative report for January of 2014. And then we have the stub heading. The stub heading is listed right here. It's the MR number. That's the um, stub heading. Okay. And then our stubs are directly underneath it. 789, 321, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here's our stub heading, and directly beneath it are our stubs. Okay. Now to the right of the stub heading is our column heading, position, date of operation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the stub heading, and these are our column headings. And directly underneath our column headings is our cells. Okay, so those are the parts of a table. Next item I want to discuss is a frequency distribution table. A frequency distribution table shows the variables that a value can take and the number of observations associated with each value. All right, so that sounds like what? Well, if we just take it really simply, here we go. A value shows the variables that our value can take. So the value in this frequency distribution, the the uh, the variables that a value can take, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, all the way through December, there is not a value that is not listed here, right? It's got to be one of these 12. So it's showing the variables that a value can take, and it's showing the number of observations associated with each value. So how many heart transplants were performed in January? Four, et cetera, et cetera, on down the line. Okay, this is what a frequency distribution table is. It's very simple. If you see all the possible outcomes with all the possible um, observations, you're looking at a frequency distribution table. We're going to talk about some graphs next, um, and I'm going to talk about each individual one, but I want to point out some things about graphs, proper graph uh, creation. You should have a title. You should always have a legend. A legend is the box that tells you usually color coded to the values in the in the graph. Um, they should always lead from left to right, not up and down. Uh, and they uh, have the, each axis should have titles and values. OK, and we're going to talk about each one of these. So here we see bar graphs and bar graphs are used for categorical data right remember categorical data the lowest form of data we have it's heart conditions respiratory there's n they don't really have anything to do with one another other than the fact that it's a discharge condition they're not relatable they're not scalable they are what they are and that's it so that is an example of a bar graph in this particular case this is a three variable bar graph i've shown the variables by 11, 12, and 13. Okay, so again, a bar graph shows categorical data, categories, heart conditions, etc., etc., etc. Next, we have pie charts, and pie charts show portions of a whole, right? So it's showing 100% all the possible results, but it's breaking it down into the possible observations or values, right? So here we can see that there were 3,542 heart conditions seen in the emergency room in 2013, right? Pieces of the whole. We add these up. These are all the all of the ER visits for 2013. Okay. Again, it's portions of the whole. And obviously, when you create a, a pie chart, you want to have the numbers inside the or a percentage inside the pie chart so that it's easier to compare. You don't want to rely on the naked eye. To make a uh, uh, an analysis of the data. Our next one is line graphs, and line graphs are important to show data over time. We're showing data over time using a line graph. And here, the x as all line graphs should be, the x-axis is the time period, 
and the y-axis is the variable. And you might remember, you might have be recalling or having nightmares from some of these graphs from HIT226, right? So here we can analyze that the number of ER visits has gr more than gradually has dramatically increased over the past three years. Okay, again, line graphs are for data over time. Our next graph here that we're showing is a histogram. And a histogram displays frequency distribution for continuous numerical data. And this is created from one of those frequency distribution tables. So here it would be January, February, March, because they're running into one another, right, if we're using that frequency distribution table. There's no gap between these rectangles. That's the key that you know it's a histogram because it's continuous, right? Five goes right into six, 10 goes into 11. When we're using a bar chart, we're talking about categorical data. When we're using a histogram, we're talking about continuous numerical data, okay? That's when you know it's a histogram. And finally, one of my favorite, gra uh, <laughs> my favorite graphs is a scattergram. A scattergram shows a relationship between two variables. And here are my two variables. Over here on my y-axis, I have final exam grade. And on my x-axis, I have time in minutes spent studying. And I have all these results that I've plotted. So this particular individual spent 30, let's say 30 minutes studying, and they got a 58. This, this particular student spent 40 minutes, and they got less than that, a 55. But when you plot all of the results, you notice something, don't you? You can see here that the more time spent studying, the better the grade. Hint, hint. Right, people? <laughs> all right. So, and then when we do is the computer will draw a straight line through your graph. And if it's increasing, we know that is a positive variable. If it's going down, that is a negative variable. Okay? Or if it's scattered all over the place, there would be the line might be just straight across, which would show that there is no variable between the two. Okay. Or no, I'm sorry, no relationship between the two variables. Okay, so that was scattergram. All right, Darby, you beat it there. Um, next, uh, we're going to talk about more of their distribution by bar chart. That again. That again is a table or graph that displays the number of times a particular observation occurs. Then uh, our next statistic here is range. And a range is a measure of variability between the smallest and largest observations. So we're really just going to take the subtract the lowest value from the highest. So in my example here at the bottom where I have age of first heart attack in males, my range would be 24. And I would get that by taking 66 minus 42. Next, I have um, measures of central tendency. We have three different types. Our first is mean slash average. And the mean is determined by calculating the arithmetic average of the observations in the frequency distribution. So our first thing we would do is we would add up all of our values, 42, 55, 58, 66, and 66 and divide it by the total number of values, which is 5. So that's 287 divided by 5, and our average would be 57.4. Uh, our next item here is the median. Or, I'm sorry, our next measure of central tendency, and that's median. And the median shows the midpoint of a frequency distribution. So our, mid, our, I'm sorry, our midpoint, or median, is 58. So look over here. We have our age of heart, first heart attack in males. And we have five values, so the dead center one would be 58. Okay, that's the median. All right, um, our mode is the most frequent observation. And in our, again, in our example here, our most frequent observation would be 66. Okay, so those are what we call measures of central tendency. We also have descriptive health healthcare statistics. Um, descriptive tells us something about our, our data, okay? So our rank 
our rank basically tells us where do you fall in all of the values okay so if there were a hundred values and I my value was 55th I would rank 55 out of 100 okay we then can break those up um, into quartiles deciles and percentiles okay so a quartile would be taking all the values and dividing them into four equal parts decile would taking all the values and divide them into 10 equal parts and then percentiles would be individual uh, breaking them into 100 um, groups because that would be you know uh, percentile would be percentage in a way of, uh, of looking at it so if we had let's say I ranked well we're gonna take it easy so let's say we had a hundred values and I ranked 55 I would rank in the third quartile right because numbers 1 through 25 is the first quartile 26 through 50 is the second quartile 51 through 75 is the third and 76 through 100 is the fourth so whatever I rank would place me within that uh, which my rank would be 55 as I said I would be in the third quartile and now again with decile we have 1 through 10 11 through 20 and so on and so forth so if I ranked 55 I would be in the fifth decile and if I ranked 55 in, in our percentile, I would rank 55th, right? And when we discuss them in terms of descriptive statistics, if I were to rank 55th in height, that would mean I am, I am uh, greater than or taller than 55% of males. Or you could reverse it and say I am shorter than or equal to 45%. Of all the males, the most common type, the most common instance where you where you will hear percentile is usually with the child's growth, right? You say your child is in the 75th percentile, or, in te or of course, or intelligence. Uh, your child is in the 75th percentile, right? The higher the percentile means the 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 the, the higher you rank in comparative to all of the other uh, values, okay? We also, under descriptive statistics, have measures of variation. Variation. I mentioned the range. Um, with regard to variance and standard deviation, you guys do not have to know the formula. It is a complex formula. But understand that the answer tells us how far apart our values are, or, in other words, how dispersed they are around the mean. So the bigger the number, the greater the variability is. Okay. So the greater the variance and standard deviation, the more further the more our values are far apart from the mean and that tells us that you're going to the greater the number the standard deviation or the variance uh, the greater our responses are right that means all of our values are are spread out across the frequency distribution okay um, our third or I'm sorry our last type here under healthcare statistics is correlation and a correlation again it's another one of those uh, statistical formulas that you don't know how, have to know how to do, but you have to understand it. And the answer of a correlation will always be between negative 1 and 1. So it might be negative 0.57 or 0.34, right? And this, like a scattergram, is going to show a, a correlation between two, value, uh, two values. If it's um, a negative, the closer it is to negative 1, it's a negative correlation. The closer it is to the positive one is a positive correlation. And if it comes and the closer it is to zero, it proves that there is no correlation at all between the two variables. Okay? And finally, here we have under healthcare statistics, we have inferential. And inferential statistics is gathered from a sample and the results are applied to the whole. So if we look at a hospital and we say our hospital uh, has a 75% survival rate. From colon cancer okay that would be descriptive statistics it's telling us something about the hospital's cancer population right aggregate data but if we were to take that statistic and apply it to the country and say okay well the country has a 75 percent chance of a uh, uh, 75 percent survival rate from colon cancer that would be inferential statistics okay so understand the difference between inferential and descriptive Okay, inferential, we're applying a little sample to everybody. All right, so real quick here, I'm going to also talk about some specific uh, 
uh, con uh, definitions in healthcare statistics. The first I want to mention is a census. Uh, we have two different types of census. Our first is our inpatient census, which is the number of patients in a facility at a particular point of time. So in an inpatient census at 12.01 a.m., we're going to count the number of bodies in the hospital. But then we have something called a daily inpatient census. And that's really important because it's going to count for those patients that were admitted and discharged that same day, right? So in the old in the old inpatient census, we're not accounting for all those services we would provide to people that came and left on the same day. Whereas a daily inpatient census, it's going to certainly tell us a more accurate reflection of the services that we provided. <clears throat> inpatient service day is a unit of measurement that was received by one patient during 24 hours. And th again, that, it's important to stress that's an inpatient service day is a measurement of service. So it's really going to help a facility understand uh, how busy they are. Okay, did we provide service to somebody? Okay. Um, the next one is the average daily inpatient census. So that's taking our in daily inpatient census, but we're going to apply it for a whole year. So if we would take the, uh, the daily inpatient census for every single day, add it up, divide it by 365, and that let us, let us know for the year 2015 what was our da average daily inpatient census. Okay, You could do that over a month, over a week. Whatever time period you want, you can create an average daily inpatient census. Usually you do it by month, and you would compare it to previous years, and you would probably see a pattern. During Christmas, during January, you're going to have an increase in... Uh, admissions, whereas during July and August you're going to have a decrease in admissions. Uh, you know, that's just an assumption on my part. Okay. Then you have the length of stay, and the length of stay is the number of patient days during the, uh, an inpatient episode. Um, so we're going to take the day of admission minus the date of discharge. So if I was admitted on August 1st and discharged on August 7th, my length of stay would be six. Okay. If they were admitted and discharged on the same day, you would count it as one. You always count the day of admission, and you never count the day of discharge. Okay. And then, now length of stay is great for one person. You can tell how long they were there. Um, but typically what we do in the HIM department is calculate the average length of stay, usually by diagnosis. I mentioned this earlier, that uh, you know we would want to know the average length of stay for congestive heart failure in men. That would be an example of aggregate data, right? There you go. So we're going to get all the men uh, who have congestive heart failure. We're going to add up all their length of stays and divide it by how many men there were, and that would give us our average length of stay. There's also other rates uh, that you're going to have to uh, calculate, and if you look at that handout, the formulas for commonly computed healthcare rates, you'll see that they are all listed there. Um, but I'm going to mention them. I think the most important thing for you to understand when it comes to rates, if you hear the term rate, you need to understand a rate, e uh, the formula is rate equals parts over base. In other words, the number of times something happened over the number of times it could happen, and then of course you times it by 100 because it'll be given as a percentage. So how many times did I eat out this week? I ate out twice. So, or for dinner, how many times did I eat out for dinner this week? I ate out twice. Okay, how many times could, have, could I have eaten out? I could have eaten out dinner every single time. So the number of times it did happen was two over the number of times it could have happened was seven times 100. And that would give me my going out to dinner rate. You can do this with anything, okay? Death rates, autopsy rates, infection rates. It's always gonna be the number of times something happened over the number of times it could have happened, okay? Um, so we have uh, some formulas here. I'm not going to go into them each and every one, but I would definitely stress that you review the rates and more so understand what they mean. Okay, understand the rules. Like if you're talking about fetal deaths, you know that it's only intermediate and late. You don't include early, um, and those sorts of little rules um, uh, just to help you understand the 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 purpose and the function of these statistics. They're not that hard once you understand what a rate is. Okay, and then you just apply the little twists and turns, like what's the difference between gross and net? Okay, gross is everything. Net usually takes something out of the equation, right? Think of gross as your your income, right? Your uh, 
your your pay is what you know you get your paycheck it says gross income and then of course the government gets a hold of it and they take out whatever percentage and then what you're left over with is the net okay so it's understanding a couple of these concepts um i i really recommend the horton textbook for your review i think it's the easiest to follow it gives lots of great uh samples you can work on um, for the for these rates, healthcare statistics, the Horton textbook uh, is my my preferred textbook. All right, so what are the references that I've used today? I've used uh, Horton, Sales, and Schnering. Real quick, we're going to go over some questions, and then I will give you the answer. The system in which a health record number is assigned at the first encounter and then used for all subsequent health care encounters is the A unit numbering system. Which filing system is considered the, to be the most efficient? Alphabetic? I, I'm not going to read them. I'll just let you look at them. And then the answer, of course, is terminal digit. Which specialized type of progress note provides healthcare professionals impressions of patient problems with detailed treatment action steps? And the answer is care plan. Remember to use the component, remember to review the components of the health record. And components means the forms. In an integrated health record, documentation by health professionals is organized. B, intermixed in date sequence. John Smith as treated at a, as, as a patient, John Smith treated as a patient at a multi-hospital system has three medical record numbers. The term used to describe multiple health record numbers is, and of course you guys can always pause this recording uh, if I'm going too fast, so uh, if you want to take a time to guess, to look it up, please feel free to do so. And the answer is B, overlap. All of the following are examples of clinical data except body temp, well I'm not going to read them. And of course, the answer is D, social security number. Elements of a strong data dictionary include all of the following except A, location of the data field. The term used to describe expected data values is C, precision. The resident assessment instrument is triggered by the data collected by the, and you should know this because we were talking about data sets, not this particular one, but when you study, and the answer is B, the MDS. Which of the following registries would include the following information, AIS and ISS? And the answer is trauma, B. Which of the following data displays is best for displaying data over time? Bar, histogram, line, or pi, or pi? And of course, the answer is C, line graph. Which of the data displays is best for displaying parts of the whole? And of course, the answer is pie chart. Which of the following acts mandated establishment of the National Practitioner Data Bank? And the answer is A, Healthcare Quality Improvement Act of 1986. All right, calculate the average daily census for June. And the answer is, again, you can pause. This recording, if you want to sit down and figure it out, 37. Oh, and I just gave you guys the answer on that one. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> well, sorry about that, everybody. A patient who was admitted in the hospital at 9.01 a.m. and expires 11.58 p.m. on the same day would be A, counted as one inpatient service day. I don't know why it's messing up for me here, but calculate the mode for the following distribution. Answer is C, 5. Women's Hospital has a total of 225 live births. 
five intermediate and late fetal deaths, four early fetal deaths during the month, month of March 25th. There were 235 newborn discharges for the month. Compute the fetal death rate for March. And the answer is 2.17. As a supervisor of health information at DeVry Hospital, Greg is responsible for assuring that the hospital statistics are recorded correctly. He reported that 15 patients were discharged from MICU, discharged from MICU from October 1st to October 31st. The length of each, the length of stay for each patient was blah blah blah. What was the average length of stay for these patients? And the answer is A, 10.5. A physician's clinic sees 10 adolescent patients. Their weights are, what was the mean weight of the patients? And the average is 84.1. Last year, Houston Hospital averaged 98 births a, month, births a month with a standard deviation of six. January reported 107 births. How does the number of births in January compare to the average? Answer is B. It is one and a half standard deviations above the mean. What was the average daily census in a 500-bed hospital that gave 14,942 inpatient service days and 15,001 discharge days during the month of October? And the answer is 482. During March 19th, Nine, uh, I'm doing, sorry, during March, 19 patients were discharged with a total of 209 discharge days. Which of the following may be calculated from the aforementioned data? And the answer is average length of stay. During the previous year, a large county in Chicago reported 28 homicides to the health department. They were, there were 35% from gunshot wounds, 25% from stabbings, 3% due to domestic violence, and 2% from road rage. Given the, given the preceding data, what would be the best graphical representation? Variable bar chart graph, line graph, table, or pie chart? And the answer is a pie chart. And that's it, and we're at the end. Does anybody I'd ask if anybody has any questions, but this is not a live recording with students. So I will say good luck to everybody. Make sure that you uh, study, you read the textbook, you read the, uh, the Horton book, uh, and you certainly use the PRG. All right, thank you everyone, and good luck.